Amen. You're there in 1 John chapter 2. I want you to focus in on uh, the first couple verses there. And uh, notice what it says in verse 1. It says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so who is he? Jesus Christ, the righteous. So Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. Now, this word propitiation uh, is a word that we don't really use, uh, you know, in modern uh, vernacular, uh, or, I'm sorry, vernacular today, um, you know, being a, to propitiate for somebody, right? Uh, but it simply means to, like, uh, basically uh, atone, appease, um, you know, uh, you know, another word which you probably have to look up to is conciliate, um, but that basically means to, like, placate or pacify, okay? And so, basically, Jesus is um, the, the, the mediator between God the Father and us, and that, that makes sense, right? Because there's one mediator be, between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And that, Je- you know, uh, even Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Okay, so there's only, uh, Jesus is that, that you know, middleman, if you will. And now, Jesus is God, you know, we know that the, the, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one, or the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, um, but it's basically saying that he's a propitiation, you know, and it says for our sins. Now, this word's used three times in the New Testament, and the word atonement is only used once in the New Testament. Now, if you're looking in the Old Testament, atonement's used a lot, okay? Um, but I want you to see at least all three places where propitiation is used, and two of them are actually in 1 John. So go to 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, and then I'm going to get into the point of the sermon, okay? So first of all, Propitiation is basically meaning the payment, the atonement, you know, what's uh, basically taking care of our sins between God. Because what is a sin? Well, the Bible says in 1 John 3 that sin is the transgression of the law, okay? So sin is just simply breaking the law, right? So if you were to say, you know, sin could be a generic term that doesn't mean breaking God's law. But if you say, like, you've sinned against me, you know, it could just be like you've done something wrong to me personally or whatever, right? Or, you know, if you broke the speed limit, you know, you've sinned against the law of the land or something like that, right? But you have, like, God's commandments, like the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. You know, those are sins, right? Because uh, you're breaking God's commandments, and that's simply what it is. So, basically, what, what's happening here is with the propitiation is that Jesus is reconciling us, you know, because of our sins. And in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9, it says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Okay, so we see the same thing coming here as far as the fact that Jesus uh, was sent to be the propitiation for our sins. It says that he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, right? And that makes sense, right? Because the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, right? So we're talking about the world, we're talking about everybody, right? Whosoever believeth. Now, go to Romans chapter 3. This is the, the third and final place in the New Testament that you'll see this word, propitiation. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 21, it's actually in verse 25, but from verse 21 to verse 26 is all one sentence. So we're going to get the whole context here of what we're talking about. Romans 3 and verse 21, it says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus." So this is very clear. First of all, that salvation is not by works at all. Okay, it's not by the law. 
It's not by works, it's by faith, it's freely given unto us, and you know, we can't get there on our own. We come short of the glory of God because we've all sinned. But it's stating here that the propitiation through faith in his blood. Okay, you say, what's the point of this sermon? Okay, the fact that Jesus obviously is the Savior. The point I want to get across here is that there's actually a lot of things that Jesus did that are encompassed in this propitiation. Okay, because we're a lot of times being accused of basically uh, denying that Jesus paid for our sins through the body, right? Because we believe that Jesus, his soul was actually in hell for three days and three nights, and then he rose again, right? And we're, we're constantly being accused of that, you know, basically denying, well, you're saying that the death on the cross didn't save us. That's not what we're saying. But what the Bible teaches is that the propitiation is not just the death on the cross, okay? And through here, we see that. What's the propitiation? Through faith in his blood, okay? Now, here's the thing. It's not just his blood, though, okay? John MacArthur, for example, the false prophet that he is, denies the blood. He basically says, well, the blood is just, the, it's just talking about the fact that he died, okay? And what I want to do is I want to go through the, the specific things that are for the propitiation of our sins, okay? And this is going to be an abridged version, okay? Meaning that in all of these, you can go real deep into it, okay? And look at all the passages that talk about this. But I just want to give you, uh, you know, some idea of what that's dealing with. But first go to Romans chapter 5. You're in Romans 3. Go to Romans chapter 5 because this is the one place that atonement's used. And, you know, people that, that say that, it's a, you've heard the term straw man argument. Okay? So, for example, and I'm going to prove to you unequivocally that Jesus' soul was in hell for three days and three nights. But what they do is that in, in, to, to fight that... Okay, instead of saying, well, they're trying to answer the passages that say it, what they say is like, well, you're saying that when he was on the cross and when he died on the cross, uh, that wasn't enough. And that is what I'm saying. Okay, you're like, I can't believe you say that. I'm going to prove to you from the Bible that that wasn't it. Okay, now that's not saying that wasn't part of it and that wasn't needed. Okay, there's a difference. And the straw man is saying like, well, you're saying that you know, he didn't die, you know, his body didn't take our sins. Who said that? I want to know one person that says that Jesus did not bear our sins in his body, okay? Because I, have ne I haven't heard that from a believer, okay? I'm sure there's some cult out there that thinks that, okay? Because obviously there's Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, and they believe all kinds of weird stuff when it comes to Jesus and, you know, the fact that he's not even God, okay? So that, that, that's uh, another story for another day or another false doctrine for another day, I guess. But go, go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. It says, much more than, Romans 5 verse 9, it says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So now we're, it says we're being justified by his blood, okay? Verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, okay? So now we're talking about, okay, the blood, now the death, okay? Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Do you see three different things that are mentioned there? Blood, death, life. Okay, so you can't say that, well, it's just the death. Okay, because I'm going to show it to you that if you didn't raise from the dead, then the death wouldn't matter. Okay, so it has to be everything. You can't just take a piece and be like, that's it. That's all of it. No, it's everything. And now... Look at verse, uh, verse 11 there, and we'll see the word atonement used here. It says, not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Okay, so this is the only place in the New Testament that that word atonement is used. But propitiation is pretty much a synonym of that. Okay, that you're atoning for your soul, you're getting a propitiation for your soul. Okay, so let's first of all look at, uh, you know, the argument that people use with this. Okay, go to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, to say, and what they want to say is that when he died on the cross, when he gave up the ghost, everything was done. Everything was done to pay for our sins. Okay? And that's their argument because of what comes next. Okay? And what the Bible teaches, where was Jesus for three days and three nights? Okay? And they'll say, well, he wasn't paying for our sins because he already did that on the cross. Okay? And this is the argument they're, they're going to use. John 19, verse 3. Or, I'm sorry, John 19, verse 30. 
It says, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Okay. Well, case closed, everything was done. Okay. You know, everything that he had to do to pay for our sins was done. Well, you know, the Bible says, you say, well, you know, was it done? Well, first of all, the Bible says this in 1, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17. You don't have to turn there yet because we're going to get to that. But it says, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. So tell me again that it was, everything was done when he died on the cross. Okay? And I'm not saying, and I'm going to explain to you what this means when he says it is finished. And it's funny because I wore that shirt that says tetelestai which is the Greek word that's used for when it says it is finished, okay? But let me tell you something. That word telos or, uh, you, know, you know, just form of that word, telos just means end, okay? So if you said o telos, right, it would just mean the end, right? And to tell us day, it just means it, meaning like it's, uh, you know, he, she, or it is done or finished or accomplished, okay? And the thing is, is that, you know, reading through the Greek New Testament, you know how many times that word is used all over the place. When Jesus got done on the Sermon on the Mount, you know what it said? When he got done, when he finished the words that he had said, you know what words used there? That same word. Okay. But people use these Greek words, but they don't understand Greek. And they, ne they never read through the Bible in Greek. And they say, well, see, to tell us day. That's like, I mean, when they say to tell us day, that's like when you get your loan done. You've completed your loan. They stamp to tell us day. It's finished. You know, everything's done, right? It's like, no, it just means it's done. But the question you have to ask yourself, what was done? Okay. And, and I, you know, they, they'll go off in this whole tangent and everything as far as like, oh, you know, when it says to tell us day, I mean, it's all done. Everything's done. Okay. Well, it's funny because in John 17, He's praying to the Father, saying, I have finished the work that you've set me on the earth to do. Okay. Well, has he gone to the cross yet? And the thing is, is that he was finished with something. You say, well, what was he finished with? Well, go to James chapter 1, and I'm going to read to you 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. Okay. So, when he was on the cross... The sins of the world were put on him. You say, how do you know that? Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree? That's how I know that. When he was on the cross, the sins of the world were put on him. Okay? And when it was put on him, when he died, he said, you know, before he died, he says, it is finished. You say, well, what, what did he mean by that? Well, you could go to John 17 and be like, well, he's just finished the stuff that he's done on the earth, right? Because it's funny because John is the only place that uses that language where it says, I have finished the work that I've done. And it's John 19 where it says it is finished. Okay. But that, that would be enough. But how about this? In James chapter 1, verse 19, it says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. I think that makes a lot of sense because for the wages of sin is death. And when Jesus was made to be sin for us, Right? He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. So Jesus, who knew no sin, lived a sinless life, was God in the flesh, you know, was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. It says that he was made to be sin for us when he was on the cross. And it says, when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. So doesn't that make more sense? That when he was made to be sin on the cross, he says, it is finished, and then he died. He gave up the ghost like immediately after he said that. And then James is stating that, okay? So you say, well, why does he say it is finished? Because he, it was accomplished, you know, the fact that he was made to be sin for us, okay? Now, does that mean that's the only thing, the death, okay? And that's what people want you to think. You know, they say, well, it's just the death, okay? Well, was it the blood too? Well, go to 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, and I was kind of quoting that off to you a little bit there. But notice what it says here. And here's the thing. You don't have to pick and choose. You don't want to be like, well, I don't, you know, I'm going to pick this part of it. How about all of it? How about I believe everything that Jesus did to save me from my sins? How about I believe the virgin birth? How about I believe the fact that he lived a sinless life? How about I believe the fact that he got baptized to fulfill all righteousness? How about I believe the fact that he was righteous? 
that he was Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. How about I believe it all? Like I said, this is an abridged version, but you can't just say, well, he did this, but this part wasn't part of it either. No, everything's a part of it. Okay? But when, when we're dealing with the payment for our sins here, the prerequisite is obviously that he's sinless, he's God, you know, he's a sinless sacrifice. You know, that's the prerequisite to even do the act of dying for our sins. But this is what it says in, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. And this is more like a Bible study, but really, and you say, well, I, I've, I've already, I already know this. You need to just look at this. You need to study this out and you know this. Because there's too many people and, and too many saved pastors at that that will, will basically try to nitpick this and try to say that we're pe- teaching some damnable heresy by saying that Jesus went to hell, okay? When you either believe the King James Bible or you don't, okay? That's what I have to say about that. You either believe the King James Bible when it says that his soul was in hell or you don't. But here's the thing. I don't have to pick and choose. I'm not saying it was just that, okay? Because notice what it says here in, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. It says, who is, who, whose own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree? that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So now it's saying that we're healed by his stripes. Okay, go to Isaiah 53, because that's what this is being quoted from. Isaiah 53. Say, what is this talking about? What does stripes imply? Okay, Jesus was beaten, right? He was scourged. And the Bible says this. You know, this is in my notes, but it says this, that his visage was so marred more than any man. Okay? You know what that means is that he was beaten so bad that it didn't even look like a man. Okay? And that's in Isaiah as well. Um, But the thing is, is that when it says by his stripes we are healed, it's implying the blood. Okay? Because when it says stripes, you're not just talking about the fact of getting beat. Okay? You're talking about the fact that it's bleeding. Okay, stripes of blood. Okay, notice what it says in Isaiah 53 and verse 5. It says, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned away, I'm, I'm sorry, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Okay, so th- does this contradict? No, the fact is, is that his blood actually saves us too. Did it not say that, that he's giving us the propitiation for our sins through faith in his blood? Okay? So the blood is also a part of the atonement. Okay? You don't believe me? Go to Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus chapter 17. The dreaded Leviticus. Okay? Leviticus, is a lot of it is, is dealing with sacrifices, right? It's the Levitical book, right? Because the Levites were the priests you know, under Aaron, as far as the priests go, but they were the ones that were to keep the sanctuary, they were to do the sacrifices and all this, and a lot of Leviticus is like different sacrifices from peace offerings, drink offerings, meat offerings, burn offerings, uh, you know, all these different things that they were doing. But notice what it says in Leviticus 17 and verse 11. Leviticus 17, verse 11, it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Can it be any clearer that the blood atones for your soul? Okay. And notice that it even says here, I have given it to you upon the altar. Okay. This is obviously talking about the fact that God is dying for us. God, his blood is being shed. Jesus Christ is giving his blood for an atonement for our souls, okay? How about in, uh, you don't have to turn there, but in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So do you see how the blood is a very important factor in the propitiation? I mean, good night. In one of the places where it says propitiation, it says, He's the propitiation through faith in his blood, okay? So to, th- to take that out and say, well, the blood is important, and that's what John MacArthur and some Calvinists do, okay, is they want to downplay the blood and be like, well, the blood just implies death, okay? Um, and it's, and I'll, sh- I'll prove to you that that's false, okay? Because not only did the stripes of his blood heal us, 
It talks about how that blood was literally taken into heaven and sprinkled for us. Okay? And so I'll, I'll confess to you that I believe it wasn't done until even when he went up to the Father. Okay? He rose from the dead and he was here on the earth. And I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay? But the propitiation for our sins wasn't even done when, when, when the stone was rolled over. Okay? And he came up out of the tomb. It was done when he physically went into heaven to sprinkle the mercy seat for us. Go to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. John chapter 20 and verse 17. You're like, this is deep. Yeah, this is deep. But you know what? This is, this is something you need to know. Okay? If there's anything to know, it's how Jesus paid for our sins. Okay? The propitiation, the atonement. And know this is that People are going to throw these straw men at you and say, well, you're saying that his soul went to hell, therefore you're denying that, that it's the blood that saves, or you're denying that it's the death that saves. Well, I'll say this. If you think it was all done when he died on the cross, then you're denying that the resurrection saved you. And you're denying this right here, okay? That the blood in the mer- uh, that's being applied to the mercy seat in heaven isn't a part of our salvation, okay? Because I want you to notice what Jesus says, okay? Because Mary Magdalene, was the first person to see Jesus, okay? And so Mary Magdalene, this is the first person to see him, okay? This is very important to understand because notice what it says in verse 17. Remember, he thought, she thought he was the gardener, and then she realized that it was Jesus. Verse 17, it says, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, Okay? But, I go, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. You know what ha- hasn't happened yet? He has not ascended up into the heavens yet. Okay? So this is like the in-between where he's risen from the dead and he's outside of the tomb, but he has not yet gone into heaven yet. Okay? And he says, don't touch me. Now, you say, well, maybe he was just never to be touched after he rose from the dead. Well, tell that to the rest of the women that like, held his feet right after this and to Peter and all those when he says, handle me and see. And he tells Thomas, thrust through your hand into my side and be not faithless faithless, but believing. Okay, So obviously they touched him. And the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1 that we've looked upon him and our hands have handled. Okay, So it's not that no one ever touched him. It's the fact that he wasn't done yet. Okay, And you say, "What what is he doing? Well, go to 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to plainly tell you what he did. Because in the Old Testament, which everything was a picture for a time then present, a figure for a time then present, it was all basically the picture of what Jesus was going to do. And when they would do the sacrifice, every year the high priest would go in to the holiest of all. And it says, with blood of others, meaning that he would take animal blood into past the veil, where the Ark of the Covenant was at, and he would sprinkle the mercy seat that was on top of the Ark of the Covenant. But all of that was pictures of the true, meaning that everything that Moses made from the Ark of the Covenant to the table of showbread to the, the, the candlestick, everything that was in there was pictured of what was already in heaven. Okay? So notice what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. It says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience, notice this, and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So it's stating here that the sanctification of the Spirit and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ is a part of how we're saved, okay? Because it's talking about being elect, okay? And being elect is just by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and you become the elect. Now, go to Hebrews chapter 9. And again, I've done a whole sermon on this. I think it was called the blood of sprinkling, okay? So I don't want to be exhaustive with this because... I don't have time to do that whole sermon again, okay? I'm trying to give you the, the, the pieces of the puzzle here, and each one of these could be its own sermon, okay? But the blood of sprinkling, okay? Notice what it says in uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. It says, But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. It's making it very clear that he's the high priest, not of this tabernacle, not of this building that's made with hands, not so it wasn't with the one that was in Jerusalem, but it's the one that's in heaven. It says in verse 12, 
neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, there's other verses on this, okay? It talks even about Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24, and to Jesus, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel, okay? And there's other places that talk about him going into the holiest of all with his own blood, okay? But the idea here is that that's what was going on. When Mary Magdalene was wanting to, like, obviously embrace him, because, you know, who wouldn't, you know, if your Savior just rose from the dead, and he's like, don't touch me not, okay? It's not because she was a woman, okay? And be like, I don't want to hug you, you know? You know, it, that's not what it was about. It's about the fact that he had not ascended, and if you know how that works, is that he can't be made unclean, okay? He is the high priest, and he had to take his blood before any unclean person would touch him, right? And, and listen, everybody that's on the earth that has flesh right now is unclean, okay? To a, you know, like our flesh is unclean, okay? And so spiritually speaking, we're saved. We don't have sin, you know, in our soul and our spirit, but our flesh still does. And basically he's stating, don't touch me because I've not yet ascended. Do you see how you can't say that it was all accomplished when he died on the cross, Okay. Not everything was done. You know, even when the tomb was rolled, you know, the stone was rolled over in the tomb. Do you see how it wasn't even finished yet until then? Now, go to, uh, go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And here's the straw man. who's saying, well, you're saying that it wasn't the body sacrifice. You're saying that it wasn't that his body that, that had sin. No one ever said that. Actually, I use that verse, whose own self, Bear in his own body on the tree. You know, bear our sins in his own body on the tree. I use that verse out all the time out soul winning. So who's denying the fact that he took our sins in his body? Okay. I, I, I can't think of anybody that's denying that, that's a believer. Okay. But in Hebrews chapter 10, I just want to make this point that I believe that. I believe his body was offered for a sacrifice. Okay. And the reason people get off, and they get into really false doctrine here, because what they're going to say, say, well, his body died for our sins, but that was the man part. So a man died for you? You're, the man's the propitiation for your sins and not God? Okay? And you'll be like, well, that's not what we're saying. That's what it sounds like to me. Okay? You say, well, you don't believe that the man Christ Jesus is the mediator? Yeah, but I also believe he's God. Okay? I believe he's holistically God. Body, soul, and spirit, okay? And that's a great mystery, that God was manifested in the flesh. That means his body's God, his soul's God, his spirit's God, right? Everything's God, okay? But everything's also man. And that is a mystery, okay, to try to wrap your mind around that. But the idea here is that his body is obviously a sacrifice of both God and man at the same time. And I don't believe anybody's denying this, but when you try to separate the soul as being God and the body as being man, you got some problems. Because hereby I perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. So who laid down his life? Was it just a man? Or was it God? Okay. So, but uh, you're there in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, and I just want to I just want to iterate this and just prove this that hey, yeah, his body was given to us for sacrifice. It was, you know that his body took sin upon it and died. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, it says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice an offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. And what he's making a point here is that, hey, listen, those burnt sacrifices and all that, that never took away sins. For the blood of bulls and of goats shall never take away sins. That's what the Bible says. So in the Old Testament, it's not that anybody was ever saved by doing those sacrifices. They were all a picture of what was to come. They were all just to get right with God. Okay? As a believer, we don't have to do that anymore. You know, if I want to get right with God, I come boldly unto the throne of grace. You know, I confess my sins to my Savior. It says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, I don't have to bring a goat or a bull and have the, high, you know, the priest like slay it and lay my hands on it and confess my sins. You know, no, I just come straight to the high priest himself, which is Jesus Christ after the order of Melchizedek. So um, that being said, you know, the Bible is basically just making it very clear. Hey, listen, all these sacrifices, he didn't have pleasure in those. 
It's not like he just wanted animals to die and to be killed and all that, but it was a picture, okay? All of that throughout history of them doing that was the picture, hey, there's going to be a blood sacrifice, a burnt offering that's going to be made, okay? Notice what it says in Hebrews chapter nine, or 10, verse 9 there. So it's, uh, 10, verse 9, it says, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Talking about the Old Testament to the New Testament. But the, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standing daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Okay? So it's very clear here, right? Those sacrifices never take away sins. But Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay? So he was, you know, in God's eyes, it already happened, right? He speaketh of, of, the, he speaketh of those things which be not as though they were. Okay? And so to him, you know, he's outside of time. He knows that, that Jesus is going to do it. He knows that it, in his mind it's already been done. Okay? Um, even Revelation, for that matter, things that haven't happened yet today, it, you know, to him it's as if it's already been done. But that being said, is that, yeah, his body was made a sacrifice once for all. And what they want you to think with this is that, well, see, it was done once for all when he died on the cross. Okay? Nothing else was required after that. Well, that's interesting, because notice what it says in verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. When did he sit down at the right hand of God? As soon as he died on the cross? Or was it when he ascended up into heaven and sat down on the right hand of the Father? So tell me again that that sacrifice that's done forever was finished right at the cross when he died on the cross. Because he hadn't even ascended. Good night. He the stone hadn't even been rolled away. He hadn't even got into the garden to talk to Mary to say, don't touch me yet because I've not yet ascended unto the Father. And so you can't say that the sins were, all, that sacrifice was done until he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, okay? You know, that's something that's mentioned a lot, actually. If you look at Hebrews chapter 1, you know, it even talks about this as far as that he by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, okay? That's, you, that's if you want to know where the accomplishment, as far as like, where did it end, okay? When he sat down on the right hand of the Father, okay? Doesn't that sound like a finale to you? He sits down. He's like, I'm done. I've accomplished everything. Okay? And so, again, this isn't all inclusive as far as like going into all the details of everything here. But what do we see? Well, his stripes healed us. Okay? So when he was beaten and the blood from his stripes, not only that, but that definitely applies to the fact that the blood was taken up to the, the holiest of all in heaven and the blood was sprinkled in the holiest, you know, in the tabernacle in heaven, okay? So that, that covers both ends of the spectrum if you think about it, right? It's, it's before he even gets nailed to the cross and it's after he you know, comes out of the tomb, he comes up to heaven and puts that blood on there. See how the blood is like just applied all the way across there as far as what's going on with the blood? His body was obviously a sacrifice because his, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Okay, so like I said, who's denying the fact that his body bore our sins? Okay, but how about his soul? Okay, well, go to, go to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53 has a lot of information as far as the atonement, you know, what Jesus did to pay for our sins. Okay. Isaiah 53 and verse 8. So we saw the blood, we saw the body, and that's where a lot of people want to stop. As they say, well, when he died, that was it. No more payment had to be made. Okay? Well, let's see what Isaiah 53 says about that. You say, well, that's the Old Testament. Is that really going to tell you everything? I'm going to show you Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, actually, the New Testament is going to be extremely clear. Okay? But this also shows you that it wasn't just the body, okay? In Isaiah 53 and verse 8, it says, He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. So what's it talking about? He's killed, right? He's being killed and he's being cut off from the land of the living, okay? And notice what it says in verse 9. And he made his grave with the wicked 
and with the, the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. You say, what is this talking about? He was nailed to the cross between two malefactors, okay? And he even says later on that, that uh, he was numbered with the transgressors, right? So basically, he, in his death, he was, he was killed as if he was a transgressor, as if he was wicked, right? But it says that he made his grave with the rich. That's because Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man, and that was the tomb in which he was buried, okay? So there's a lot of information here. I don't want to get too far because we're going to get to Isaiah 53 eventually. But uh, the part I want you to get to here is verse 10. It says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Do you see that right there? Because you say, well, it's just the body that's made an offering for sin. No, it's not just that. Okay? But here's the problem. They say, they say well, you're denying that his body is made an offering. No, I'm not. His body is made an offering for sin, but his soul was also made an offering for sin. Okay? And it says his soul, that when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the Lord, I'm sorry, and, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Okay? And what they'll say, well, okay, his soul is made an offering for sin, but that doesn't mean he suffered. Okay? And this is what a lot of people do because they don't want to deny the fact that it says he went to hell. Okay? What they'll say is like, well, he went to hell, but he didn't suffer. He wasn't paying for our sins. Well, what's an offering then for sin if not paying for our sins? But here's the thing. What, what's it say in the next verse? It says in verse 11, And he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Sounds like his soul is travailing. Okay? You know that word's used a lot. It's used a lot dealing with women and childbirth. Would anybody say that childbirth is not, uh, is not painful? Okay? Ladies, any lady that's ever had a child, <clears throat> would you say, oh, no, that's just pleasant. I remember we, we, were, uh, you know, we did those uh, baby classes, those birthing classes before we had Clara. And the you know, main reason I want to do this is because I want to learn how to do CPR on a child you know, because that's my biggest scare is they choke on something, right? or a Heimlich, you know, for, for the child. But they were saying, well, some women, they actually enjoy it. I'm like, who is this beast? <laughs> like, I've never heard of a woman enjoying childbirth. Um, but anyway, all that to say is that, you know, even from the Garden of Eden, you know, when they fell, they talked about how in, tr you'll travail in childbirth, okay, and, and bringing forth children. From the, you know, anyway, not to get into that. But what I'm saying is that travail is not pleasant, Okay. And so he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide a portion with the great and shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors and bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So verse 12 is just kind of recapping everything, if you will, of the fact, of the fact that he's going to bear our sins, he's going to die, he's going to do all this, right? But it's very clear that his soul was made an offering for sin. You say, well, did Jesus mention this? We'll go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40. You say, this is just a hobby horse. This isn't a hobby horse. This is just what the Bible teaches. Okay? And when people are trying to say that I'm teaching some damnable heresy by teaching this, then yeah, I'm going to defend it. But here's the thing. I'm not just going to get on this and be like, that's the only thing to focus on. And that's the only thing that paid for our sins. Okay? Because I would say the same thing about the blood. And I would say the same thing about the body, you know, sacrifice and him dying on the cross. I would say the same thing about the resurrection. And I would say the same thing about Jesus going into heaven itself with the blood to sprinkle in the mercy seat. I would say all of that, you can't just say, well, that's not a part of it. That's not a part of it. This is only the part of it right here. No, it's all of it. Okay. You say, well, do you need to explain all of this out soul winning? No. Okay. <laughs> you know. The Bible says that they just need to understand the death, burial, and resurrection. They died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. Do they need to know all the little details? No. Okay. Do I sometimes explain it? Sometimes I do because, you know, some of these details will help someone understand, hey, obviously I can't say myself if this is what had to be done. Right? If his soul went to hell for me and that's where I would have gone, then how in the world would I have to pay for any of my sins? Okay, So I use it as an example, but listen, I've won people to Christ and given them the gospel where I don't explain that. Okay, But you know what I always mention? That he died for our sins and he rose again. 
Okay, I always mention that. Okay, but is the and, and, I, and listen, there's people out there who'd be like, you didn't mention the blood in your uh, in your soul winning presentation. They didn't get saved. Give me a break. Does it say that I have to mention that? Now, did I say that the blood wasn't required? Now that would be a different issue, right? I'd be like, the blood doesn't save you. All right, let's pray. You know, like, like who's doing that? Okay, but what, would it not be a bad thing to bring it up? Sure. Bringing up the blood is a great thing to bring up. Bringing up, you know, what ha- where was he at for three days and three nights? That's not a bad thing to bring up, okay? But it's, it's a false argument is what they do with that. And they say, well, you bring it up in your presentation. You're saying, it, and you're saying, you're, you're going to get stuck on it. This is the whole point I'm re- preaching this sermon because I want you to know that, you know, his soul going to hell is not the only payment. His body on the cross is not the only part of the payment. His blood is not the only part of the payment. His resurrection is not the only part of the payment. It's all of it, okay? But what, they, what people will do is they say, well, you mentioned it in there. You're saying that if someone doesn't believe that Jesus' soul was in hell, then you're saying they're not saved. That's not what I'm saying, okay? That's not what I'm saying. Because there's plenty of people that I get saved and don't go into that, and they just don't know, okay? They just don't know all the details, you think I knew all the details when I got saved? You think I knew about the blood sprinkling on the mercy seat? I didn't know about that. But here's the thing. Does that change the fact that that was part of it? Okay? Because God isn't that cutthroat <laughs> to the point where it's like, you know, you're trying to teach a child to be like, you need to understand every little detail of what he had to do, right? You know, you go back to Genesis and you're like, all right, let's talk about Abraham and Isaac and just all these pictures and all this stuff that went into this. Listen, I am not one of those people that thinks you have to have a seven-week Bible study to figure out how to get saved, okay? It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that he died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day. Boom, that's it. You understand it's a gift. You understand it's eternal security. You cannot lose your salvation. Simple, right? But that doesn't mean that that is just like that abridged version of how people get saved is the, all the details as far as what he had to do. Okay, because within that death, burial, and resurrection, there's a lot going on. Okay, now in uh, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, notice what it says. Matthew 12 verse 40, it says, and by the way, I want you to notice this when he's reading, when he's stating this, he says, "This is the only sign you're getting." Okay, because he tells, he's, he talks about a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh that for a sign, and it talks about the fact that this is the only thing you're getting. Okay, is this sign right here. So don't you think that's important? Okay, if he's like, I'm going to give you one sign, one thing to be looking for here. Okay, and it says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay, so we see here that, what are we talking about? Well, the three days and three nights, that should be very clear that we're talking about the death, burial, and resurrection, right? I mean, just over and over again, it says he's going to die, and on the third day, he's going to rise again, right? But this is stating where he's going to be for those three days and three nights, in the heart of the earth. Now, we believe the earth is round, okay? It's not this flat disk where it's on the back of turtles, okay? It's round, and in the center of it is a big ball of fire, okay? Science will tell you that, and you could test this, prove this, all this, right? Um, you know, lava comes out of the volcanoes, okay? We can figure this out really quick. But all I have to say is that the Bible says that hell is beneath, okay? And anywhere you're on the globe, what's underneath of you is what? The earth, right? The, 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 the crust of the earth. And then underneath that is a big ball of fire. Well, the Bible says hell is in, in the center of the earth, is in the lower parts of the earth, okay? And another way to say that is the heart, okay? The heart is the center. You, you probably heard the term, you know, let's hear the heart of the matter, okay? So heart isn't just talking about that organ, okay? Even when it's talking about your heart, you know, it's not always talking about that physical organ. It's talking about your core, like who you are, right? Okay. Now, that being said, um, he's saying that he's going to be in the heart of the earth. It says, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. Now, I'm going to give you a little clue on Bible study, okay? If Jesus is saying, this is going to be like something else that happened in the Bible, here's a clue with Bible study. Go back to where that happened and see what he's talking about, okay? Because he doesn't tell the whole story of Jonah. He just says, as Jonah was in the whale's belly, not as Jonah was on his way to Nineveh or as he was fleeing away or as when he was in Nineveh, preaching to those in Nineveh. No, he says, as he was in the whale's belly, okay? 
And there's no coincidence that in Jonah, go to Jonah chapter 2, that it was three days and three nights, okay? And no one ever wants to do this. Anybody that doesn't believe that Jesus went to hell for three days and three nights, they never want to put these two together. Because who would do that, right? If Jesus said, you know, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. to be like, you know what, maybe I should go back to Jonah and see what happened. What, what was going on? Was he having a party while he was in the whale's belly? Now, I know you probably watched Pinocchio, and there's like a different story that's going on with that, okay? But Pinocchio and Jonah are two different stories, and obviously, honestly, I haven't even seen Pinocchio. I can't remember if it was good or bad in the whale's belly, okay? I just know when he came out, was he a real boy? Is that what happens? I don't know. So <laughs> that was one movie I never watched, and I just don't have a desire to watch it. So anyway. <laughs> Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. So, the end of chapter 1, he gets swallowed up by this fish. And now you say, Well, it says fish, it doesn't say whale. Well, you know, they didn't determine, or they, you know, scientists haven't determined at that point that a whale isn't a fish anymore. Okay? You know, it's like in the 1800s, they're like, You know what? All those, those animals that can breathe air, you know, that are breathing air and don't have gills, those are mammals, they're not really fish. Um, this was, this was uh, translated in 1611, okay? So this was before they made that distinction. Just like dinosaurs. They're like, oh, dinosaurs aren't in the Bible. That's because dinosaurs, the term dinosaur was coined in like the 1800s. This was translated in 1611, okay? So obviously that word's not going to be in there because that would be weird, right? They saw into the future. They knew what was going to happen. And therefore, that's how it happened, right? Unless you're a Ruckmanite, you might actually believe that, okay? But Jonah, one, Jonah 2 in verse 1 here, he's in the fish's belly, and it says in verse 2, And said, I cry by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Okay? Now, the question you have to ask yourself, did Jonah go to hell, okay, or was he in the fish's belly? Okay? And what you're going to see with this chapter is that some of this is talking about physical Jonah in the fish's belly, in the whale's belly, right? And, it's, and then other parts are talking about Jesus. Okay? So when it says that I cry by reason of my affliction, you, know, you can definitely see how that would be Jonah. But then you can see how out of the belly of hell cried I, and it's prophetically talking about Jesus. And you say, well, but it says I. Okay? Well, I'll I'm going to show you a place where it says I, okay? And the prophet that wrote it, it's not talking about him. Okay? And, but here's the thing. Keep reading there. It says, For thou hast, hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, all the billows and thy waves passed over me. So who's this talking about? Jonah, right? I mean, that would make sense. I mean, he got swallowed by a whale, and he's in the ocean, and all this stuff's going on, right? It says, Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Okay, so you can definitely see some spiritual application as far as how this would apply to Jesus, right? But at the same time, clearly Jonah, right? The weeds are wrapped around his head, you know, talking about waves, talking about the sea, okay? Now here's where it gets interesting. Verse 6, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, and the earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Is that a little different? Did, did Jonah, did the whale go to the bottoms of the mountains? Okay, because that's what they say, well, he just went really deep. Listen, I don't care how deep you go into the ocean, you're not underneath the mountains. Okay, and you say, well, what's underneath the mountains? The Bible says the first mention of hell is in Deuteronomy 32, 22. And it talks about how his indignation burns unto the lowest hell and it sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. First mention of hell in the Bible. And it talks about that it's underneath the foundation of the mountains. Okay? And what does it say about here? It says that he went down to the bottoms of the mountains, and the earth with her bars was about me forever. Which is another proof that the earth is round. Okay? It's about him. Okay? It's around him. He's basically, he's in the center of the earth. And what did Jesus say? He said that as Jonas was three days and three nights in the heart of the belly, I'm sorry, in, in the belly, the fish, good night, I can't. As Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so saw the Son of Man be three, day, uh, th three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay? 
So it's like that, and you can understand why he's saying this, because in Jonah 2, it's like talking about Jonah in the belly of the whale, and it's talking about Jesus in the, heart, in, in, in the belly of hell, right? And the heart of the earth. And underneath the foundations of the mountains, under, and the earth with the bars was about me forever, okay? You say, why was it forever? Well, because our, our punishment for sin is an eternal punishment, okay? Hell is eternal, okay? And Jesus paid for it in three days and three nights. And you're like, how is that possible? Because he's God, okay? Because it was a sinless sacrifice. No one else could do that, okay? He paid an eternity of hell in three days and three nights, okay? God's outside of time, and so it's an eternal punishment. He has saved us to the uttermost, and he's attained eternal redemption for us. Uh, and you say, okay, I see what you're saying there. Well, go to Acts chapter 2, because I'm going to show you clearly where it says that his soul was in hell. That should be enough for you, okay, in the fact that Jesus, the one place where he's mentioning where he's going to be, besides his body, right, it says that his body, you know, talks about how he's going to die and he's going to rise again the third day, okay? And it says, you know, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up, right? He's talking about the body, okay? So he definitely talks about the body being destroyed and raising it from the dead. But, you know, when it comes to where his soul's going to be, then there's just not a lot mentioned on there. And Matthew 12, 4, 40 is that key, okay? It's saying, okay, where is, where, where is his soul going to be? But in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, I first want you to see this. Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, it says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So we're talking about Jesus being crucified and killed, right? Verse 24, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Okay? So I want you to first see here that he's being loosed from something, because he rose from the dead, right? So obviously that means he's being loosed. Um, but the pains of death. Now, I've heard people explain this like, well, the pains of death is just de decomposition, you know, or, you know, your body decomposing. It's like, that, that's not painful, right? If someone, like, dies, like, they don't feel that, okay? But here, here, how about a verse for you? Psalm 116 and verse 3. Psalm 116 and verse 3. Because this idea of pains of death and hell is actually used a lot in Psalms. And actually in 2 Samuel, because 2 Samuel 18 is a psalm, and it's repeated, okay? But, um, but in, in Psalm 116, which is clearly a psalm that's dealing a lot with Jesus, I don't have time to go into this, really, but uh, I want you to see this correlation, though. In Psalm 116, verse 3, it says, The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me, and found trouble. I found trouble and sorrow, okay? So, unless David was in hell, okay, saying that the pains of hell have got hold upon me, they say, well, he's using this, um, you know, hyperbolically, right? You know, he's just kind of using it as a term, and I think that could be true in a sense, right? But here's the thing, that the idea of pains of death and pains of hell are used synonymously in the Bible, okay? So when it says the pains of death, listen, we're talking about death and hell. Hell beneath is called death, okay? It's where the dead are. Okay? doesn't mean that they're out of consciousness, because they're conscious of what's going on, but they're called dead. They're not called alive. Okay? No one is living in hell. They're all dead. Okay? And it says, the pains of hell got hold upon me, but the Bible says, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Okay? So the pains of hell, the pains of death got hold upon him, but it was not possible that that could hold him. Okay? Now go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 29, and this is Honestly, you know, I could have taken you here and said, all right, close up your Bibles, go home. Okay, when it comes to this subject, okay, this should, be, this should be enough. But I was trying to lead into this to show you, okay, the Bible says that his soul is to be made an offering for sin. Jesus said that he was going to be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, as Jonah was in the whale's belly. In Jonah 2, when it talks about him being in the whale's belly, it says, out of the belly of hell cried I, and that he went to the bottoms of the mountains, and that the earth with their bars was about him forever. Okay? And so it makes very clear where was he at and what was going on, okay? And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 29, it says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, okay? And why is he saying this? Because David wrote Psalm 16, okay, which says, 
thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Okay? So David wrote that, but he's stating, hey, this wasn't talking about David. Okay? Notice what it says. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. You know why that can't be talking about David? Because it says, I will not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will I suffer thine holy one to see corruption. David saw corruption. It says he's, de he's dead. His sepulcher is with us today. So this can't be talking about David. And notice what it says as you keep reading there. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Okay, so he's saying, this is talking about the Christ. And this is what this uh, passage in Psalm 16 is talking about. Acts 2.31 says this, He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus had God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. So it's proving to you that Psalm 16, when it says, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will I suffer thine holy one to see corruption, that's talking about Jesus. Okay? And it's very clear that his soul was not left there. Why? Because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Okay? Because on the third day he rose again from the grave, and his soul came up out of hell, and he walked on the earth, went up into heaven, all of that, right? Go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, in verse 17. Because what people will say, like I said, they'll say, well, the body was the man part and the soul was the God part. Well, it's going to be a problem, okay, many ways. I've already kind of discussed that, why that would be a problem. But I want you to see here, who was dead? Who was dead? Was it just the man, Christ Jesus? Although I will admit, yeah. Okay, like I said, I'm not denying that. Not denying that the man Christ Jesus died, okay? But it also talks about the man, the son of man ascending, you know, it, you know what it says? <laughs> you know, and sometimes I think we read over this type of stuff. When it says that as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, shows how the what? Son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, okay? So you can't separate these things, meaning that the soul is also regarded as the Son of Man, just as much as the body. You can't separate and be like, well, the Son of Man is just the body, the Son of God is the soul. No, the body is the Son of Man, Son of God. The soul is the Son of Man, Son of God. The Spirit is the Son of Man, Son of God. Okay, both, all the way, all the way across the board. Okay, now in, uh, in Romans chapter, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, it says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Okay? So, the person that's talking here is saying, I'm the first and the last. You know what the Bible says in, in uh, Isaiah? It says, I'm the first and the last. Inside me there is no God. I am God and there is none else. I am the first, I am with the last. You know, just over and over again. We've kind of already covered this if you've been here for the Isaiah study. But this is saying, I'm God. Okay? I am the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, right? And it says, I am he that liveth and was dead. So who was dead? Was it just a man? Or was it the first and the last? Was it God? You're like, I can't, uh, you're saying that God died? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what the Bible's saying. Okay? You say, that doesn't make sense. How could God die? I know the Muslims can't understand that. The Jehovah's Witnesses can't understand that. The Mormons can't understand that, and that's always their argument, isn't it? And it's interesting that that's, that's somehow coming into Baptist churches now where they're saying, I can't believe that God would die when the Bible says that God died for us. Hereby I perceive we the love of God that he laid down his life for us. Who laid down his life for us? I'm the first and the last. I'm he that liveth and was dead. The first and the last was dead. But it says that he wasn't just, he didn't just die and that was it. It says, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and amen, and had the keys of hell and of death. Now, if he didn't go to hell for three days, three nights, it would kind of make, not make that much sense if he's like, I got the keys of hell and of death, okay? Now, the thing is, is that hell and death are like these two terms that are very closely related, okay? Death is a place and hell is a place. 
Hell is usually re regarded to as far as what's going on in that place, you know, what it's called. Death is more so like the people that are there, like the state of being of the people that are there. Like I said, they're not out of consciousness. They can still feel and think, but they're, they're called dead, okay? But go to Hebrews chapter 2, and this is the last thing I'm going to say about this subject, because I want you to just logic with me for a second about this idea of, uh, you know, only his body dying, okay? Now, let me ask you this question. As a believer, will our body die? Barring Jesus doesn't come back in our lifetime, okay? Let's just say, for sake of argument, Jesus doesn't come back in our day. Will our body die? Yes. No doubt our body will die, right? So, let me ask you this question. What does it say here in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9? But, when, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. You know, the Bible says that whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Why? Because he tasted death for every man. If that's just talking about the body, I'm going to taste of death. Does that make sense? That as Christians, barring Jesus doesn't come back in our lifetime, we will all taste of death physically. But you know what will never taste of death? Is our soul. Our soul will never taste of death. Because whoso overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And who is he that overcometh? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So the idea here is that it wouldn't make sense if he's tasting death for every man, and that's just talking about a physical bodily death, right? Do you see how that doesn't have much significance if we're all going to die? And you're like, well, but there's a resurrection of the body. I understand that, okay, that the body will be resurrected. But if he's going to say that you're not going to die, and I'm going to taste death for every man, you've got to know that that's not just talking about a physical death, okay? If anything, that's just talking about that spiritual death that would happen in hell, okay? And so it's very clear that he paid for our sins when his soul was in hell, but that's not the only place that he paid for our sins. Does that make sense? I want that to be super clear. When we're talking about the propitiation for our sins, the atonement for our sins, you had the blood, you had the death, you have his soul in hell, you had the resurrection, you have him going into the holiest of all with his blood and sprinkling it on a mercy seat, and you have him sitting down at the right hand of the Father. And, you, and so don't tell me that I'm saying, well, I'm just taking this one part right here. Okay, because I take it all. You're like, which part do you choose? I choose it all. I don't have to choose. It's just that's all, all the things that he had to do. Okay, and like I said, you know, there's false arguments out there saying, well, you, you're saying that if you don't, you mention that his soul was in hell, then people can't be saved. Who said that? I want to know who said that. I want to know who's saying that. These people, who are they? Right? I want to know what preacher said that. Now, I could be wrong. Maybe there is a preacher out there that's saying that, but they're wrong. Okay? Now, and uh, go to, I mean, the last thing I'm going to show you is the resurrection, okay? Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm going to read to you Hebrews 7, 25. It says, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The fact that he has this endless life, he ever liveth, he was risen from the dead, that, behold, I'm alive forevermore, you know, all of that, that's a huge part of him being our Savior, okay? You know, we have a Savior that lives, okay? That's the only religion that can say that. Every other religion, their prophet died and is still dead. Christianity is the only religion that teaches that our Savior, our prophet, our priest, our king, is still alive today, Okay? And uh, he, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8, it says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Notice in verse 9, now, he, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. To try to take out that part where it says he descended into the lower parts of the earth, do you see how much scripture you have to take away to say, well, this wasn't part of it? It's making it clear, like, hey, listen, 
before he ascended, okay, before that happened, he descended first into the lower parts of the earth. And by the way, it's the same person that descended down to the lower parts of the earth that ascended up far above the heavens, okay, that he might fill all things. And notice that ascending up into the heavens is where he's filling all things, not when he just came out of the tomb, okay? That's where you get into the sprinkling of the blood, okay? Now, 1 uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 15, last thing I'm going to show you here. It's just showing you what I was kind of quoting to you at the beginning there. As far, as far as the resurrection, you can't say that when he died on the cross, when he says it is finished, that that was everything that had to be done to pay for our sins. Can't be said. Because then you have to take out the resurrection. We don't just teach that Jesus died for our sins. We teach that Jesus died for our sins and rose again to pay for our sins. Okay. Now in verse 12 here it says, Now if Christ be preached that he, that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, we, we, I'm sorry, yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, Ye are yet in your sins. I, I know this is like kind of a tongue twister and it's kind of going back and forth, but you know what it's saying? They're saying, well, there's no resurrection of the dead. He's like, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Jesus didn't raise from the dead. And if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, your faith is vain and you're in your sins. He's just got done saying what the gospel was that saved us was that, that he died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And if you take out the fact that he rose again the third day, you're taking out the gospel. You're taking out what he actually did, okay? And so to say that, like, no, it was all accomplished, everything was done, he just sat down after that, and he was just done paying for our sins. That's not true. It goes against Scripture, and you can't just take that one piece and say that's it, okay? I take it all. I take the blood. I take the death. I take the burial. I take his soul in hell. I take the resurrection. I take the fact that he went up into heaven and, and he sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat. I take the fact that he sat down after he was done purging our sins. That's what I take. And that's the propitiation for our sins. And it's funny to me, you know, when people say, well, you have to be a good person to go to heaven. Look at what Jesus had to do, okay? You know, look at everything he had to do for us, and you're going to tell me that your works have anything to do with your salvation? When you think about everything he had to do to pay for your sins, listen, our good works are a drop in the bucket compared to what he did for us. When you think about everything that he had to go through and everything that he did, paying the eternity of hell for you, you know, that's a big deal. And I hope that this sermon, first of all, gives you some uh, you know, understanding of that whole subject, but I also hope that it gives you, uh, you know, just a gratitude for what Jesus did for us. You know, all the stuff that he did for us to pay for our sins, and it can never be uh, said enough. Okay, like I said, that's an abridged version of every piece, you know, that I, that I would just come to mind if I was going to tell you what he paid for our sins and how he paid for our sins. But that's, that's not everything as far as, like, all the places the Bible talks about it or all the little other details and all that. Okay, that's just a, a view into just what he did for us. But we can't just pick and choose. You can't just say, I just like, I like that piece, but I don't like that piece. Okay. You know, no, I like it all. And when we preach the gospel, you don't have to go through this whole dissertation, okay? Death, burial, and resurrection, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Explain what that means. Boom, someone can get saved, okay? But that doesn't mean that you couldn't go into those other avenues and explain it, and that would help people understand it, okay? There's nothing wrong with explaining more to people. Does that make sense? You'll never go wrong by explaining more information to people. Okay, if you're ever like, man, I think I'm explaining too much to you right now. <laughs> don't be afraid of that. Okay, keep it simple. Okay, but don't be afraid to actually teach people more than you have to. Okay, so let's end with a word of prayer. Dearly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for a word, and thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and rising again the third day, and just all the elements, Lord, that go into that. And Lord, it's just uh, it, it's awesome to see uh, everything that you've done for us and to see all the details, and Lord, I, I thank you that you show us all of that in the Bible, and we probably won't fully comprehend all that you really did for us until we're there with you in heaven, 
Um, but Lord, we just thank you for what you have showed us and that we can uh, dwell on that, think about that, and just you know, love you for what you've done for us. And Lord, we love you. I pray also in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.